I'm Robert Child, and I'd love for you to join me on my brand new podcast, Stories of Faith and Courage. In gripping narratives, we'll walk alongside ancient heroes who face down giants, conquering adversity, and hear tales of modern-day warriors whose unwavering faith sustained them through the darkest of times. Plus, we'll explore enigmatic ancient mysteries like the connection of the Shroud of Turin to the Knights Templar that will leave you on the edge of your seat. I hope you'll join me on Stories of Faith and Courage. It's available now on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to D-Day in 90 Minutes, our 15-part weekly podcast series that delves deep into the historic Allied invasion that turned the tide of World War II. In Episode 4, The Americans, we learn in detail about American involvement in the war, the common soldiers' attitude, armaments, and even their impact on women in Great Britain. Over 100,000 British women married American soldiers. I'm Robert Child, and Episode 4 of D-Day in 90 Minutes will begin in a moment. Summer is a great time for catching up on military history, and my book about the seven Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II, Immortal Valor, has just been released in paperback. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes, life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you pick up the new paperback version, hardcover or audiobook, available in stores and online. D-Day in 90 Minutes. Written by William Bradle, Robert Child. Narrated by Travis. The Attackers, the Americans. A veteran infantryman is a terrified infantryman. Private Carl Wiest, 5th Ranger Battalion. By June 1944, there were over a million American soldiers in Great Britain, primarily in the South. In general, the Americans and Brits got along, but there were some complaints. They were summed up by the phrase that the U.S. soldiers were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. A phrase generally credited to the British comedian Tommy Trinder, 1909 to 1989, whose most famous comedic film role, Sailors 3, revolved around his escapades attempting to capture a fictional German battleship. With a lot of money, cigarettes, and available nylons, the average American soldier was attractive to British women after five years of war and shortages. Over 100,000 British women would become American war brides. The United States Army numbered 190,000 men in 1939. By D-Day, it numbered 7.2 million men, with 2.3 million being Army Air Corps. The average soldier was 26 years old, 5 foot 8 inches in height, and weighed 144 pounds with a 31-inch waist. 10% had some college, slightly less than half were high school graduates. This sounds low today, but in Depression-era America, school was an unaffordable luxury for many teenagers. The vast majority were draftees or conscripts. Roosevelt revived the World War I draft system with the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, the first peacetime draft in U.S. history. Drafts were first done in the United States during the Civil War in 1863, leading to large-scale riots in major U.S. cities. The Confederacy had conscription from day one. The World War I draft was introduced in 1917, with all men ages 21 to 30 having to register. After Pearl Harbor, all men ages 18 to 45 were liable to be drafted and all men ages 18 to 65 had to register. Ten million men were drafted into the service in World War II. Thirty percent of the men called were rejected for medical reasons. Conscientious objectors were put into non-combat jobs. The 12,000 objectors who would not do any service in the military were put in the civilian public service, doing jobs primarily in isolated national forest parks until 1947. Upon joining the Army, either as an enlistee or draftee, the majority of the men were not in shape. To condition the men for combat, 
The Army developed a systematic physical development program as a critical part of combat basic training. And at the end, all men had to pass the Army Ground Forces test, consisting of squat jumps, sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, and a quarter-mile run. The organization structure was similar to the British and German infantry structures. Rifle squad of 9 to 12 men with three squads to a platoon, three or four platoons to a company, three or four companies to a battalion, three or four battalions to a regiment, three or four regiments to a division plus support. This made a total of 15,000 to 20,000 men per division. The core unit was the rifle squad, led by a sergeant, usually carrying a Thompson submachine gun, then 10 riflemen carrying the M1 Garand semi-automatic rifle and a BAR, or Browning Automatic Rifle, operator. The squad was divided into Able Team, two scouts, Baker Team, five riflemen, and Charlie Team, three riflemen and a BAR gunner. Patton called the M1 Garand rifle the greatest battle implement ever devised. The rifle is air-cooled, gas-operated, and semi-automatic, meaning the gun can shoot as fast as the rifleman can pull the trigger, for a rate of fire of 45 to 50 shots a minute. The German infantry rifle, the bolt-action Mauser, was capable of only 15 rounds per minute. John Garand, a Canadian-born engineer, working at the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, designed the M1 in 1928. The Armory made weapons for the U.S. military from 1777 until its closing in 1968. The Armory was ordered closed by Defense Secretary Robert McNamara to outsource production to private manufacturers. The M1 held an eight-shot clip, which ejected with a distinctive ping when empty. A plastic clip was introduced late in the war because many soldiers thought the enemy was sighting in on them when hearing the ping although no German or Japanese soldiers ever mentioned the noise after the war. The M1 was the standard infantry rifle until 1957, with over 6 million manufactured. A lighter version, the M1 carbine, was designed for officers, paratroopers, and tankers, and were sometimes carried by a rifle squad sergeant. Many officers and NCOs issued the weapon would abandon it at the first chance trading it for a regular M1. Carrying a different weapon attracted too much attention. A weapon that attracted attention but was not abandoned because of cost and efficiency, it could fire 600 rounds per minute, was the Thompson submachine gun. John T. Thompson designed the gun in 1918. It was a hit with mobsters and had numerous nicknames, including Chicago Typewriter and Chicago Piano but it was more commonly called the chopper, or just Tommy gun. It fired the same 45 caliber round as the U.S. service pistol, the 1911 Colt model, and was in service until 1971. When introduced, the gun was available for sale to the public for $200, a time when a Ford car cost $400. It was carried by NCOs, paratroopers, and British and Canadian commandos. A replacement, the M3, commonly called a grease gun, was much cheaper but more unreliable and not in service at D-Day. The automatic weapon support for the rifle squad was provided by the BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. The gun was used in World War I and II, Korea, and at the beginning of the Vietnam War. The BAR shot the same ammunition as the M1, was heavy at 20 pounds, the Garand weighed 10 pounds, with a rate of fire comparable to a Thompson. It was designed to be fired from a standing or prone position, though the rate of fire made it difficult to handle and fire accurately standing up. All the men in the rifle squad were trained on the BAR, but usually there was a designated gunner with an anecdotal lifespan of 30 minutes. The gun was sometimes carried on aircraft. In one incident, a pilot of a C-46 transport plane shoved the gun out his window over Burma and shot down a Japanese Nakajima fighter plane. Finally, one soldier would carry a bazooka in addition to his M1. The bazooka was a recoilless rocket-propelled anti-tank weapon, originally designed in 1917 by Dr. Richard H. Goddard, 
who would go on to build the world's first liquid-fueled rocket that led to modern space exploration. The TV show Star Trek Next Generation featured a shuttlecraft named the Goddard. In addition to his weapons, the average soldier on D-Day had his dog tags, name, blood type, inoculations, and religious affiliation. There were two, one for a survivor to take for notification and one to stay with a body. Gas mask and a pack containing 3K and 3D rations, four heating cans, raincoat, blanket, shelter half, shaving kit, and an entrenching tool strapped to the back. He wore a two-piece helmet. Outside was the one-size-fits-all helmet, while the inside had a helmet liner with adjusting straps. The two together weighed a bit less than five pounds. Clothing was wool, cotton, or twill, undershirt, shirt, jacket, socks, long underwear, and trousers. The shirt, jacket, long underwear, and socks were coated with CC2 anti-gas paste for D-Day. The CC2 was greasy, smelled awful, and stiffened the material. Shoes were lace-up ankle boots with canvas leggings, also treated with CC2. In May and early June 1944, the soldiers going on D-Day were marched or trucked to staging areas that became known as sausages because of their oval shape. No more passes no leave, the men slept in their pup tents. Of the 50 U.S. divisions employed, only two, the 1st Infantry and the 82nd Airborne, had seen combat of any type. This was not by chance. The Army planners theorized that experienced combat veterans would not attack across an open beach. Only highly trained troops, but troops not having seen the carnage of war would make the attack. So the American soldier was well-equipped, weighted down, and well-trained. But he had never seen combat. The planner's theory proved true. Sergeant Carwood Lipton of the 101st Airborne said, I took chances on D-Day I would never have taken later in the war. These infantrymen would be supported by thousands of planes, ships, and tanks. But on the morning of June 6, 1944, they stormed the beaches alone, fighting only with the guns in their hands and the supplies on their backs. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of D-Day in 90 Minutes. Join us next time for Episode 5, The British, The Canadians, and Everyone Else. That's next time. I'm Robert Child, and this has been D-Day in 90 Minutes, only on Point of the Spear. Music licensed from Audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.